From St. Paul's Baptist Church, here's the scoop. St. Paul's Baptist Church, VCU Healthcare Systems, and the Children's Hospital Foundation invite you to enroll your child or student in Camp Explore. This interactive camp experience is designed to introduce children and students to medical careers. If a child can see it, they can be it. So enroll your elementary school child for our free one-day camp on August 19th by emailing imagination at myspbc.org and your middle school child for our one-week all-day camp July 31st through August 4th by emailing smb at myspbc.org. The one-week camp is $100, which includes all activities, meals, and field trips. Some scholarships are available. Space is limited, so act now. Do your words ever land you in trouble? Do you worry about your finances? Do you feel stuck in your career? Have your friends let you down? In this New Bridge Bible Study series, our senior pastor, Dr. Lance Watson, highlights principles from the book of Proverbs that relate to these and other challenges we all face. Discover wisdom that will guide your steps and grow your kingdom influence as you embrace the abundant life God has designed for you to enjoy. Series begins June 8th. We give praise to God for our new members. Every new member is required to complete our DNA class. It's a one day, 90 minute introduction to our church family. See the class schedule and login details at myspbc.info slash DNA. Camp Invention is an international STEM camp for children entering grades one through six that St. Paul's Baptist Church has been honored to host for eight years. The 2023 camp theme is Wonder. Our SPBC camp will take place Monday through Thursday, August 7th through 10th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at our Belt campus. Imagination and SMB Sunday School groups will break for summer Sunday school groups will reconvene Sunday, August 13th during the 9 a.m. service at our North Campus. Imagination and SMB are recruiting Sunday school teachers and teacher assistants to join our teams. We ask volunteers to serve one Sunday a month at either our North or South Campuses. Interested in serving? 
Email imagination at myspbc.org to serve ages 2 through elementary school or smb at myspbc.org to serve middle and high school students. Youth Community Strings is an after-school program for children who love music. Designed for young elementary students with no previous musical experience, children will be guided from the beginning of their musical journey. Participants will receive a robust music education, learn to play an instrument, and find a sense of belonging through playing music. There is no cost to participate and all instruments and supplies will be provided. A daily after-school snack will also be provided. Program will meet from 3.30 to 5 p.m. every Tuesday through Friday after school at the St. Paul's Baptist Church Belt Campus. Transportation will be provided from Red, Swansboro, Blackwell, and Oak Grove Elementary Schools to St. Paul's. This year, our program is open to second grade students. Learn more and apply today at myspbc.info slash youth community strings. Questions? Email ycstrings at richmondsymphony.com. Thank you for your time and attention. This has been The Scoop. Your voice and say it. Say, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy forever. Say, Lord, you are good.
I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Let us pray. Gracious God, our eternal Father, for this day, for our lives, and the many blessings you've bestowed upon us, we say thank you. We praise you because you are good. We bless your name because you're faithful. We honor and adore you because you love us even when we don't love ourselves. We worship you because you alone are worthy of our praise. You're our keeper, you're our sustainer, you're our healer and our way maker. We've gathered here today, streaming service in expectation for replenishment and revitalization. So cleanse us now, Lord, from all unrighteousness and fill us up with all your joy, your peace, your love, and hope so that we will trust in you. In this moment, we surrender it all to you. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place and you're welcome in our space. Arrest our thoughts so we can focus our hearts and minds on you. Shift our posture to be available for whatever it is you are about to do. Bless our senior pastor and give him a word like only you can that will alter our lives so that you will be glorified. You're so awesome. You're so merciful. You're so kind. And we praise you in advance. And the people of God say hallelujah and amen. How excellent is your name, your name is strength, your name is power, a strong tower makes me
church family. I am Vernita Williams, the Life Stage Pastor of Imagination Children's Ministry. On behalf of our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Lance Watson, First Lady Rose Watson, and the St. Paul's Church family, we welcome you to St. Paul's Everywhere. We are touching the world with love, communicating the positive power of Jesus Christ to our generation. Out of all of the places and pages where you could have paused your cursor, you stopped here and we're glad to have you. There are a number of ways to engage with us right now. If you're brand new, text the word new, N-E-W, to 804-643-4769 and let us welcome you. If you're worshiping with us on social media, use your life stage color emoji and greet the person before you and behind you in the chat space. If you're at home watching on television, computer, or iPad, greet the people in the room with you. If you're worshiping alone, first know that you're never alone, but call or text somebody and invite them to join you online for worship. If you like something, hit the like button. If you think about somebody you wanna bless, don't be stingy, hit the share button. When the message and the music speaks to you, please do comment in the chat space. My main point is this, we want to worship with you, not for you. So let's connect, let's get involved, let's worship God, and let's do it now. Come on, make it personal to me. And we thank you this morning. Come on, can you worship him? Come on, open up your mouth and worship him. Come on, open up your mouth and speak well of him. You're an awesome father.
let's worship. Come on, let's worship. Come on, let's worship the good, good Father. Come on, let's worship the King of Kings. I said, let's worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are our Father. You are our Father. You are our Father. We bless you this morning. We bless you this morning. We give you praise this morning. Glorious is the name of Jesus. We praise his holy name for God is great and worthy to be praised. Happy Independence Day weekend to every single one of you. We celebrate this weekend freedom in this country of ours, but also freedom that we know through Jesus Christ for whom the son has set free is free indeed. There's a word from the Lord that I'd like to share with you out of the book of Numbers chapter 27 verses 1 through 4 and we want to tag this text with the title change the game would you type that in the chat space very quickly change the game now let's listen for a word from God the daughters of Zelothaphed showed up their father was the son of Hepter son of Gilead son of Makar son of Manasseh, belonging to the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The daughters were Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah. They came to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They stood before Moses and Eleazar the priest and before the leaders in the congregation and said, our father died in the wilderness. He wasn't part of Korah's rubble anti-God gang. He died for his own sins, and he left no sons. But why should our father's name die out from his clan just because he had no sons? So give us an inheritance among our father's relatives. And Moses brought their case to God. The word of God for the people of God, all praise be to God. Change the game. Discontentment can be a positive virtue. Discontentment is the birthplace of possibility. Discontentment is life's way of telling you that there is more for you. Genuine discontent, if accompanied by action, can result in positive change. Dr. Angela Davis, that world-class intellectual and revolutionary, said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Oscar Wilde wrote that discontentment is the first step of progress for a person or a nation. In fact, I want to suggest that America began as an expression of discontentment. It was revolutionary discontent that led Christmas addicts to fight and die in the Revolutionary War. The place of discontent is weaved throughout our nation's history of progress. If those who were discontent with conditions in America had left the country, what type of country would we have? We would not have strong labor unions who collectively bargain for worker rights. Women, regardless of race or standing, would be limited to a life in the kitchen with no rights at all. The environment would have no protections. Children would be subjected to sweatshops and slavery, and people of color would still be excluded from the military, the educational system, politics, Social Security, and veterans' benefits. America began as an expression of discontent and American progress has and will continue to depend upon those whose discontent force, whose discontentment forces positive change. It's important to note on this weekend that celebrates national freedom that America was built on the backs, blood, and tears of enslaved people. The economies of both the North and the South were built on slave labor banking, insurance, commodities, textiles, shipping, 
were all established on the travesty of enslavement. And that is why we who are the descendants of slaves have as much ownership equity, if not more, in this country than anyone else. Immigrants who have come to this country legally have as much ownership as anybody else. And contrary to what some extreme and bigoted corners of the population might wish, we aren't going anywhere. Everybody type in the chat space, anywhere. We will continue to critique, challenge, place under scrutiny the practices in place because that's how our nation makes progress. There's a critical need for men and women of faith and conscience to challenge the darkness that confronts our nation and indeed our world with white supremacists, nationalists, xenophobic and misogynistic sentiments openly and boldly being sprouted and touted in the public sphere. There's a need for us to openly and boldly be seen, heard, critiquing, refuting, and pronouncing judgment in the clearest of terms. This is not a time on this Independence Day weekend for acquiescence, compliance, reluctance, or timidity. With equal, if not more force, our voices must be heard and stances must be seen, resisting and rejecting demonic demagoguery coming from wherever it comes. It's time for us not simply to know the game and play the game, but to have the spine, courage, and backbone to change the game. Could I get 74 of you to type in the chat space, change the game? As I thought about changing the game, my mind was drawn to Numbers 27. The story there starts with a promise God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 6 and 7. God promised that when the Hebrews arrived in Canaan, they would possess the land. Fast forward 400 years later where the books of Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua provide information and accounts of the regulations for obtaining the land promised by God. Chapter 26 provides a census of the number of male troops that Israel had prior to entering the land of Canaan. But note, the census ignored and overlooked the women and children and only counted the men. This is important because Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, addresses the issue of clan and family where a man dies having no male heir. The ownership of his property, according to that text, would be given for the perpetual benefit of the family from generation to generation by men only. It's within that context that we meet these five daughters of a man by the name of Zelothaphat. These ladies from the tribe of Manasseh were the great, 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 great granddaughters of Joseph. They appeared before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the tribal leaders, and the entirety of the community of Israel to present their concern. Now, the reason for the roll call in this text is to inform us that they weren't doing anything undercover or in the closet. This was not a private, off-the-record conversation with Moses, nor a leaders-only forum. This was a statement made in front of everybody. It's unprecedented and groundbreaking because the normative practice was for the male leader of the family to present any concerns of the family or tribe to Moses alone. However, in this case, there was no male to stand on their behalf. So these daughters chose to stand for themselves, not just before Moses, but before everybody. If you want to know what type of courage audacity and boldness it takes to change the game. Here it is. We need the boldness to show up in difficult places. Everybody type difficult places. My dear brothers and sisters, it takes audacity to show up. It takes courage to make your presence known and felt. It takes boldness to be seen and heard in areas where you are non-existent, unwelcome, discounted, disenfranchised, marginalized, underrepresented, and misunderstood. 
I need about 50 of you to just type IKTR for I know that's right. Because it was that courage that empowered Belva Lockwood to be the first female to argue a case before the all male Supreme Court of the United States. Just her showing up was disruptive and transformative. Can I let you in on a secret? Never underestimate the power of simply showing up. You ought to act like you, John P. Key, right now and type in all capital letters, show up with an exclamation mark. Because showing up is a precondition for transformation and change. If you don't show up, nothing transformative can happen. But when you show up, the wheels are put in motion for transformation to take place. Just by showing up, People like Ruby Bridges at William France Elementary School in Louisiana, James Meredith at the University of Mississippi, Harvey Gant at Clemson University, Charlene Hunter Galt at Carolina, Dorothy Counts at Harding High, Jackie Robinson at Dodger Stadium caused transformation to take place and ensured that things could and would never be the same. And that's why there was so much resistance to them just showing up, because as long as they're not seen, nothing would happen. But when they showed up, a transformation happened in the mind, heart, and spirit of those that witnessed it. The game is changed when people of audacity and courage just show up. And as a child of God, you need to understand the power of you just showing up. God has endowed you with the Holy Spirit so that when you show up, things shift. Just your occupying space that wasn't previously occupied by anybody like you is a shift. When you show up, darkness loses its grip on the space because you are the light of the world. When you show up, falseness loses its dominance because you come bearing truth and living in truth and walking in the truth. When you show up, evil loses its confidence because you are the righteousness of God. We need courage just to show up, but also we need boldness to speak up against difficult challenges. These daughters show up, but they show up not just to be seen, but also to be heard. There's something that they must say for themselves with no one to speak for them. They know the game, they know how the game is played, but they choose to speak for themselves because the game has to change. The alternative of the status quo was a non-starter for them. They did not accept things being the way that they were. And they could not accept that nobody there was speaking to their concerns. Living in a deficit of advocacy with no one to speak for them, they summoned the boldness to speak up for themselves, to voice their concerns, advocate for their position, put a face on their issue. God not only gave them courage to show up, but also the boldness to speak up. While there is a message conveyed when you show up, my friends, there's another, another message communicated when you are bold enough to speak out, and both are necessary. The history of the progress of our nation has been due to people with the boldness to speak out, challenge the status quo, speak truth to power, give voice to the voiceless, and put a face on an issue. In the midst of the Reagan administration ignoring AIDS and HIV, Ryan White, Magic Johnson, and Arthur Ashe showed up and spoke up and became voices and faces that could not be ignored. By sitting down and refusing to get up out of her seat on the bus, Rosa Parks became a voice and a face that could not be be ignored. Martin and Malcolm and Medgar and Stokely and Fannie Lou and Angela and Huey and others spoke out and became faces and voices that could not be ignored. Winnie and Nelson and Stephen Biko and Desmond Tutu and others spoke out against apartheid and became voices and faces that could not be ignored simply by showing up and speaking out. These daughters challenged the injustice and inequity that they perceived 
in the property distribution rules of ancient Israel. With no male heirs in their family, they asked, why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Why should what is rightfully ours by birth be given to another family simply because we don't have a brother? God's promise to Abraham didn't mention gender. God's promise was to descendants regardless of gender. Why were they now adding another distinction that God did not have? And therefore, these sisters request the share of the property that would have gone to their father had he been alive. This was fundamentally an issue of justice, fairness, and equity. And it takes boldness to raise questions, especially in the midst of those who benefit from things remaining the same. You don't hear me yet. They were within, in earshot of cousins and nephews and uncles who would benefit from things staying the same. But in courage and with audacity, these daughters spoke up and spoke out to ask for their share of the property anyway. To change the game, we need the courage, audacity, and boldness to show up in difficult places and then to offer up a transformative agenda. They offered not to play the game, but they put forth a transformative agenda to change the game. Would you tell somebody in the chat space, things can't stay the same. Come on, type it if you will. Things can't stay the same. The daughters offer an alternative to what was. It was a transformative agenda. It was a bold step. God grants boldness to show up, speak out, and challenge injustice in the status quo, and to point to a transformative agenda. In other words, it's not enough to talk about what's wrong. You've then got to be able to offer another picture of what could be and should be right. Whenever a good idea is first shared, most people will say it's not true. Then when this truth is proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, they say it won't work. After its workability has been demonstrated, they'll say it's not important. But when you show that it's indeed important, then they'll say we knew it all the time. These daughters walk in the realm of the prophetic. They reassess the status quo. They critique the dominant culture and now provide an alternative vision and understanding. They speak of another way, a better way, a fair way, and a more equitable and inclusive way. The daughters declare that when it comes to parental or paternal inheritance, daughters are no less descendants of their fathers and just as deserving as sons. They recommend transforming the way that the community thought about daughters in relationship to their fathers, their legacy, their management ability and control of the generational inheritance and the continuation of the family's heritage and history. It takes courage to critique what is and to communicate what can be or what should be in the arena of those who benefit from what already is. It took boldness for Moses to go before Pharaoh and command, let my people go, when Pharaoh and the economy of Egypt were benefiting from Hebrew oppression. It took boldness for Nathan point his bony prophetic finger in David's face and declare you are the man when David was enjoying what he had with Bathsheba. It took boldness for Elijah to confront Ahab and Jezebel when they were enjoying oppressing Israel and leading them into idolatry. It took boldness for the three Hebrew boys to confront Nebuchadnezzar, refuse to dance to his music, bow to his image, and have to face the fiery furnace. It took boldness for Daniel to confront Belshazzar and continue praying to God, which landed him in the lion's den. It took boldness for John the Baptist to confront Herod. It took boldness for Patrick Henry to confront British tyranny and declare, give me liberty or give me death. It took boldness for Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, John Brown, William Lloyd Garrison, William Lloyd Steele, Harriet Tubman, and others to confront the evil 
of antebellum slavery and propose a transformative agenda, the abolition of slavery everywhere. It took boldness for Samuel Gumpers and others to speak out for the cause of workers and offer a transformative agenda through the formation of the Federation of Organized Trade and Labor Unions. It took boldness for Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Staten, and others to speak out against the disenfranchisement of women and offer a transformative agenda of women being fully enfranchised in the experiment of American democracy. It took boldness for Lewis Hine, Nolan Lovejoy, Alexander McElwin, and others to speak out against the abusive and oppressive treatment of children and form the National Child Labor Committee to set forth a transformative agenda. You've got to have boldness. Could I get 80 of you to type boldness to offer an alternative to those satisfied with the current arrangements and the benefits that they accrue. It takes boldness. Do you know why? It's risky. Come on, type that for somebody. Just type, it's dangerous. Type, it's risky. Type, it's hazardous. These sisters showed up and they spoke out. And they don't know what Moses, the tribal leaders or the community at large might do in response. They could be ridiculed, persecuted, or ostracized. Nevertheless, they took the risk of vulnerability and rejection because it's risky when you challenge the status quo. It's risky when you critique the dominant ideology. It's risky swimming against the tide. It's risky not towing the company line. It's risky not going along to get along. You risk being falsely accused, misunderstood, physically threatened, mischaracterized, misinterpreted, misperceived, socially isolated, and politi politically marginalized. You are vulnerable to hate and spiteful things said, posted, and done without warning relative to you. Showing up and speaking out is risky business because you become a threat to the status quo. Stick a pen right there so that I can tell you never underestimate how much of a threat you are. It was Dr. Douglas Shipley who said, if Africans and their diaspora were truly inferior, it would be unnecessary to rewrite their history, obfuscate their accomplishments, and work for 400 years to limit their futures. You are a threat. And if you are a Christian, you're a double threat. You're not just a threat because of what you bring to bear in the natural realm. You're a threat because of what you bring to bear in the spiritual realm. You are not a threat to the enemy as long as you're outside of a relationship with God. But once you make up your mind to hook up with Jesus, to get to know God, to be filled with the Spirit, to join the church, to use the gifts and talents and abilities that God has given you. That's when you became a real threat to the forces of darkness. That's when a bullseye was painted on your back because now you have the potential to rearrange, to transform, to disrupt, to pull down, and to build back up. These daughters show up, they speak out, and they suggest a transformative agenda in public. This action places Moses in a precarious position because Moses knows what Deuteronomy says, but he also knows the promise that God made to Abraham, and there appears to be a tension between the two. Deuteronomy 25 specifies as a male descendant, but God's promises specifies any descendant regardless of gender. What will Moses do? He doesn't send the matter to Eleazar. He doesn't call a public meeting nor call for a public referendum. He doesn't summon the tribal leaders. He took the case to the only one who could really handle the case. He took their case before Almighty God. There it is. If you're going to change the game, my friend, thirdly, you've got to talk to God. Could I get every one of you to type that in the chat space right there? Talk to God. God alone. God and God alone knows what to do with this. Moses thought it's God's land and these are God's people. 
it's God's inheritance and God's promise. Moses demonstrates that to change the game, we've got to talk to God and be informed by God's perspective. We must recognize the need for divine guidance in the steps taken. Whatever move you are about to make, be sure to get some input from God so that your move is in alignment with the purpose of God, the plan of God, and the provision of God. That is why when Mordecai came to Esther and corrected her reasoning concerning why she was in the palace, Esther then sent the message back to Mordecai saying, have all the Jews to fast for me and pray for three days and three nights because we need to hear from God. The real power of the civil rights movement was the fact that it was informed by God's perspective. And that's why before they would do anything or march anywhere or boycott anything or protest anything, they would meet up at the church and have a prayer meeting. They would call on the Lord because they had sense enough to understand that in order to have the impact that they desired, in order to have the boldness that they must exhibit, in order to be able to go through what they'd have to go through in order to be able to touch the conscience of the nation the way it needed to be touched. It would need to be God with them, God through them, God before them, God behind them, and God beside them. And I need to remind us today that it's always by way of prayer that God shifts things in a nation. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face and pray, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. God responds to Moses and says that the claims of the daughters are legitimate. You must give them a grant of land along with their father's relatives, assign them the property that would have been given to their father. Now that and that alone would have been good enough. They won the verdict. They won the case. But God goes even further in the text. God says, instruct all the people of Israel that from here on out, somebody type here on out, if a man dies and has no son, then his inheritance will go to his daughters. Now the daughters showed up for their stuff for their inheritance, for their legacy, but God extends the benefit beyond them and makes it a precedent to be held up for the entire nation. In other words, because of their showing up and their speaking out, generations that followed them would be covered. Their boldness wasn't just transformative, it was transgenerational. Listen to me now, because there is no map, my friend, for where God is trying to take you. You miss your shout, but you can get it later. The daughters that follow them will benefit because of them. Their boldness would impact future generations. I need somebody who can type fast to type. I don't just play the game, I change the rules. Did you hear what I said? I don't just play the game, I change the rules. Because God's plan is beyond you. God's plan is bigger than you. They're showing up, stepping up, and speaking up was connected to that which came before them and that which would come after them. Hear me well, my friend, being used of God to change the game is never just for the present moment. It's designed to impact and affect future moments. What God does through you is designed to impact others who are with you and those who come after you. Might we thank God this weekend for the sacrifices of men and women who showing up and speaking out set the table and the conditions for us to be blessed. Can we celebrate those who showed up at segregated lunch counters, showed up at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and showed up in the streets of Birmingham and throughout the South? Can we celebrate freedom riders who showed up in the South in 1961 to protest segregated bus terminals, whites-only restrooms, and lunch counters? Can we celebrate 
the freedom summer workers who showed up in Mississippi in 1964 to register people to vote and to set up freedom schools for community organizing. Can we celebrate the nameless and faceless ancestors who face water hoses and vicious dogs, lynchings, cross burnings, house bombings, and church burnings so that we might enjoy the freedoms that so many sadly take for granted today? Can we celebrate those those who showed up before so that coming after we might enjoy the benefits that we have now. Don't ever be afraid to step up, show up, and speak up because as long as your mouth is closed, as long as your presence is missing, as long as your voice is silent, the enemy will dictate the future. But when you step up, when you speak up, when you offer a transformative agenda after you You've talked to God, things are about to change. I've got a sneaky feeling and a funny suspicion that things are about to change for you right now. Somebody ought to type it in the chat space. Things are about to change. Because fourthly, if you're going to change the game, you have to know how to wait on God. The timing of these daughters' requests is interesting because it precedes the actual conquest of the land. Lean in right here. Yet they make their request in faith, believing God's promise to be true. They request what they perceive belong to them before any actual possession had occurred. Did you get it? They call things that are not as though they already were. It takes faith for you to request that which hasn't even taken place yet. They were committing themselves to waiting for whatever amount of time it took for the land to be conquered and for the inheritance to be delivered. These five daughters made their request to Moses, but they would not see any results until the conquest of Joshua. And yet they were willing to wait to see the change they champion come to pass. In their waiting, they saw some die. In their waiting, they saw some battles won and lost. In their waiting, they witnessed mess and miracles. In their waiting, they saw the Jordan River part and they walked through on dry ground. In their waiting, they saw the walls of Jericho fall flat after marching around the city. In their waiting, they saw the sun stand still, giving them all the time they needed to be victorious over their enemies. In their waiting, they saw the faithfulness of God because God kept them for the time and kept the time for them. To change the game, you got to talk to God and you got to wait on God because God has a day of fulfillment for every purpose that God establishes. In 1968, a Jamaican-born woman living in New York City became the first black female to enter the halls of Congress. Four years later, in 1972, that same woman declared, I am going to run for president. People said the country is not ready for a woman and certainly not ready for a black woman to occupy the Oval Office. But Shirley Chisholm ran anyway. She didn't win, but her faith, patience, and example inspired Jesse Jackson to run in 1984 and then again in 1988. He didn't win. But his faith, patience, and example set the stage so that 20 years later, in 2008, a one-time senator from the state of Illinois with a funny name like Barack Hussein Obama ran and won not just one term, but two terms as president of the United States. My point is God wants to use you to change the game because he did it with Jesus. He was just a baby born in a barn on the backside of Bethlehem. His birth threatened the status quo. Herod heard that prophecy had been fulfilled. Herod heard that the king of the Jews had been born. So threatened was he that he issued an edict to murder every male child under the age of two. 
but God protected Jesus by having him smuggled into Africa to fulfill the scripture that out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod died, God brought Jesus back to Nazareth where he grew up into manhood. At the age of 30, John the Baptist, seeing him declared, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus Christ was a game changer. He showed up, he spoke out, and when he spoke, demons got nervous. When he spoke, storms got still. When he spoke, the lame started leaping. When he spoke, the cripple started walking. When he spoke, the blind started seeing. When he spoke, the dead started rising. It was risky. He was vulnerable. He was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities. The penalty of our peace was placed upon him so that by his stripes we could be healed. Jesus showed up and spoke up at Calvary. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. He spoke up on Calvary. Today, you will be with me in paradise. He spoke up at Calvary, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He spoke up at Calvary, father, in your hands, I commend my spirit. He spoke up at Calvary, it is finished. They thought nothing had changed when they put him in the grave. His own followers were depressed and despondent, feeling all their hopes had died. But there's something about God. God says, if I said it, I'll do it. If I spoke it, I'll bring it to pass. So on the third day, just as he said, he got up with all power in his hands. And now he lives forevermore. The game changed. Truth cursed to the ground will rise again. The game changed. We can come boldly before the throne of grace. The game changed. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, I said joy, I said joy comes in the morning. The game changed. We can let our light shine. We can live in truth, walk in love, Love, move in hope, proceed in victory. The game change. We can wait on the Lord, not knowing when he'll show up, but knowing that he may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. The game change. Trouble won't last always. There is a bright side somewhere. The game change. It won't always be like this, but soon or later, it'll turn, won't it? It'll turn in our favor. It's turning around. Can anybody claim it? It's turning around for me. Are there any game changers listening to me today? Then throw your head back and shout hallelujah and amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you all the praise and honor and glory for your goodness and your mercy, for giving us the power to be game changers. So now raise up in us the boldness, the audacity, the courage to step up and step forward, speak up and speak out in difficult places to offer a transformative agenda as we talk to you and wait on you. We thank you, oh God, for the changes we have seen in our lives. We know it's been a long time coming, but we hold to the hope that a change is going to come. So bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to extend an invitation to you, my brother, my sister, to become a game changer. And the way you change the game is by hooking up with Jesus Christ. It's not difficult to have a relationship with God. 
All you got to do is admit you need him. Believe in your heart that God sent Christ for you. Confess it with your mouth and do it today. All the ways to connect with us are listed on the lower third of this screen. Scan that QR code, tap on it. It'll bring you right to us. We would love to be the one to help you to change the game. I'd love to be your pastor. We'd love to be your church, but we need now to hear from you. Won't you respond? Do it now. He moves all pain, misery and strife. He promised to keep me. Never. Let's prepare to worship God through the giving of our tithe and our offering our gifts of love on this first Sunday in July. As we prepare to give to the Lord also, prepare your communion elements so that we might share them today before our benediction. It's a privilege to be able to give to support the work of ministry happening at the St. Paul's Baptist Church. God is moving in a big way, doing big things. We have big plans, but we need your support in order to carry them forward. All the ways to give are listed on the lower third of this screen. So would you take a moment, select one, and generously and gratefully prepare to share your gift 
with this ministry. We give because God has given to us. God is good all the time. And the Lord is blessing us right now. As you prepare your gift, can we pray together in agreement? Lord, we acknowledge that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift, that from the earliest of our existence up until this present time, all you've ever been was good. So we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Bless the gift and the giver now in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Let's give gratefully and generously now. Let's do that one more time. Lift your voice and say, 
As you gather your elements, we remember the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the Son sets free is free indeed. He came to guarantee our freedom in every aspect of life. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, he gave it to them and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me. So every first Sunday that the Lord gives us life, we pause as a church family to share these elements of communion, also called the Lord's Supper. We share it as a way to remember Jesus, to celebrate his life, and to express gratitude for all that he has done for us. He prayed, let us pray. Lord, wherever we are today, bless the elements we share and transform them from their ordinary and common use and allow them to be infused with supernatural significance, that as we share them together, we might be drawn closer to you and into greater fellowship with each other. We thank you, O oh God, for Jesus Christ, the game changer. In his name we pray, amen. In the name of Jesus, let us eat and drink together. And we do these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, my friends, for sharing this worship experience with us today. Wherever you are in the world, we are praying that God would bless you beyond your wildest expectations. We know you know the game. Some of us are forced to play the game. But don't forget, you are called to change the game, not just for your benefit, but for the benefit of all of those who are coming after you. Thank you for being with us today. Won't you take a moment to click the like button if you've been blessed by anything that's been shared. Would you click the share arrow and share this stream with your network, family, and friends? Somebody needs this word that you know. And would you also click on the link in the chat space and download the message application guide so you can talk about this word, discuss this word with your family, coworkers, neighbors, and friends. Finally, on this weekend, would you share our benediction with us? It's gonna be printed on the screen. We say it out loud and we say it all together. All together, I am, because we are. And we are, because God is. You are not alone, never, never, never never alone. God is with you and so are we. We love you and there ain't a thing you can do about it except pray fervently, love genuinely, live authentically, and change the game. God bless you real good. From St. Paul's Baptist Church, here's the scoop. St. Paul's Baptist Church, VCU Healthcare Systems, and the Children's Hospital Foundation invite you to enroll your child or student in Camp Explore. This interactive camp experience is designed to introduce children and students to medical careers. If a child can see it, they can be it. So enroll your elementary school child for our free one-day camp on August 19th by emailing imagination at myspbc.org and your middle school child for our one-week, all-day camp July 31st through August 4th by emailing smb at myspbc.org. The one-week camp is $100, which includes all activities, meals, and field trips. Some scholarships are available. Space is limited, so act now. Do your words ever land you in trouble? Do you worry about your finances? Do you feel stuck in your career? Have your friends let you down? 
In this New Bridge Bible Study series, our senior pastor, Dr. Lance Watson, highlights principles from the book of Proverbs that relate to these and other challenges we all face. Discover wisdom that will guide your steps and grow your kingdom influence as you embrace the abundant life God has designed for you to enjoy. Series begins June 8th. We give praise to God for our new members. Every new member is required to complete our DNA class. It's a one-day, 90-minute introduction to our church family. See the class schedule and login details at myspbc.info slash DNA. Camp Invention is an international STEM camp for children entering grades one through six that St. Paul's Baptist Church has been honored to host for eight years. The 2023 camp theme is Wonder. Our SPBC camp will take place Monday through Thursday, August 7th through 10th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at our Belt Campus. Imagination and SMB Sunday School Groups will break for summer. Sunday School Groups will reconvene Sunday, August 13th during the 9 a.m. service at our North Campus. Imagination and SMB are recruiting Sunday school teachers and teacher assistants to join our teams. We ask volunteers to serve one Sunday a month at either our North or South campuses. Interested in serving? Email imagination at myspbc.org to serve ages 2 through elementary school or smb at myspbc.org to serve middle and high school students. Youth Community Strings is an after-school program for children who love music. Designed for young elementary students with no previous musical experience, children will be guided from the beginning of their musical journey. Participants will receive a robust music education, learn to play an instrument, and find a sense of belonging through playing music. There is no cost to participate and all instruments and supplies will be provided. A daily after-school snack will also be provided. Program will meet from 3.30 to 5 p.m. every Tuesday through Friday after school at the St. Paul's Baptist Church Belt Campus. Transportation will be provided from Red, Swansboro, Blackwell, and Oak Grove Elementary Schools to St. Paul's. This year, our program is open to second grade students. Learn more and apply today at myspbc.info slash youth community strings. Questions? Email ycstrings at richmondsymphony.com. Thank you for your time and attention. This has been The Scoop. Thank you for watching this service from the St. Paul's Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia. Please look through our website, myspbc.org, to learn more about our church, about our vision, and how you can support our mission to empower people to grow into the persons that God created them to be.